Good morning, friends. Glad to have you this morning as we gather for worship today. My name is Don Hanshu, and I welcome you who are worshiping with us online as well as in person. Today is Labor Day weekend, and we recognize that we have we celebrate Labor Day in our country to really affirm all of the American workers and all the hard work they do. And we're going to take just a moment this morning to say thank you to all you who are frontline workers. All the medical field, the hospitals are stacked and those are working overtime and, and all of our teachers who are doing amazing work and so many of whom, you know, are trying to figure out how to do virtual, you know, to pivot really fast to make that happen. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you so much. All those frontline workers at the grocery stores and otherwise. Together we make things better. We work toward the common good. And that's the theme of our worship service um, for our, our, this series that we're in, working toward the common good. And we thank you as frontline workers making that happen. I'm going to invite you to join with me in an attitude of prayer this morning. But as you look in your bulletin and you see things that you can be in prayer for, don't forget to over, don't overlook your, um, your little connection card. Fill that out and put it in the offering plate when it comes by or drop it in the basket there in the lobby. That helps us stay connected. But I invite you to pray with me in this moment. God, we thank you for this time, for how there are those among us who tirelessly work to make sure the common good is done. And I pray, Lord, in these moments in worship, that we would see how even when we feel like we're down and we've been beat up and pushed around, that you're still with us and you're helping us build in new ways. So Lord, in these moments, may we feel your spirit building up inside of us so we may burst forth in song and in praise. Guide us now in the name of your Son. Amen. Sometimes I'm up, sometimes I'm down, oh yes, Lord. Sometimes I'm almost to the ground, oh yes, Lord. I've seen nobody knows but Jesus. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Glory, My troubles dear below oh yes yes Lord nobody knows the troubles I've seen nobody knows but Jesus nobody knows Glory, hallelujah. Glory,
As you're seated, I want to just, as we prepare for an offering, I just want to share a note with you received as a church. It's, um, you all know, we, you know, we cook and do food here all the time. Doug Shipman and crew are always doing great stuff back there. And sometimes when we have extra food from an event, uh, we make sure we share that with appropriate folks. Sometimes we cook meals and give them to specific groups in town. And we received this uh, sweet, sweet note from a lady. Uh, I mean, we received a, a couple of these over the last few months, and I just think it's so special. And she wrote in here that she's 87 and a half years old, so, you know, excuse the handwriting. Um, but it says, Dear, Un- Dear United Methodist Church, thank you for the yummy food. <laughs> I may have gained five pounds. It's always fun to have a change of usual food. I appreciate your caring for us and doing something to make us make some people feel like they care. I just want to tell you that, just read that note to you, and just to see how even in what we think is our excess, what we think, you know, what are we going to do with this, how when we put it in God's hands, it blesses people. It truly blesses people. So I just want to say thank you for your generosity. It helps us bless people beyond these walls, helps us bless people as they grow in faith and fellowship. And I just want to say thank you for your generosity. The ushers will help us receive an offering, but before they do that, if we have any children who are here for our Bible experience, if so, you can go back that direction and you'll see the sign. I um, just want to make sure. Thank you very much, and our shows will help us receive an offering this morning.
seated. Today we're reading from the book of Nehemiah, uh, chapter 4, verses 1 through 9, and chapter 5 is 1 through 8. Now when Sambalot heard that we were building the wall, he was very angry and greatly enraged. He mocked the Jews. He said in the presence of his associates in the army of Samaria, what are these people Jews doing? Will they restore things? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish it in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burn ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and said, that stone wall that they are building, any fox going up on it would break it down. Hear, O God, for we are despised. Turn their taunt back on their heads and give them over as plunder in a, day, in a land of captivity. Do not cover their guild and do not let their sin be blotted out from your sight. For they hurled insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. But when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabs and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that they were repairing the walls of Jerusalem was going forward, the, and, the gasp, and the gaps were being, uh, beginning to be closed, they were very angry and all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause confusion in it. So we prayed to our God and set a guard as a protection against them day and night. For there was a great outcry of the people and their wives against their Jewish kin. For there were those who said, With our sons and our daughters, we are many. We must have grain so that we may eat and stay alive. There were also those who said, We are having to pledge our fields our vineyards and our houses in order to keep grain during the famine. And there were those who said, we are having to borrow money on our own fields and vineyards to pay the king's tax. Now our flesh is the same as that of our kindred. Our children are the same as their children. And yet we are forcing our sons and daughters into slaves. And some of our daughters have been ravished. We are powerless and our fields and vineyards now belong to others. I was very angry when I heard their outcry and the complaints. After thinking it over, I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. I said to them, you're, you're taking interest from your own people. And I called a great assembly to deal with them and said to them, as far as we're able, we have brought back our Jewish kindred who have been sold to other nations. But now you are selling your own kin, who must then be bought back by us. They were silent and could not find a word to say. The word of God for us, the people of God.
someone asked me this morning, uh, what happened to the clergy collar? And I said, well, to be honest with you, I went and looked for it this morning and found it still in the wash from last night. And so I decided this morning that I'd dress up as Don Hanshu. I don't know if I'm doing that. <laughs> Bow tie and all. Hear the good news. Nehemiah was kicked while he was down. He wasn't just kicked once or twice or even three times. He was kicked over and over and over and over again. Here's this guy who seems to be having everything going for him. He was just given back his people's most sacred city by this new Persian empire which has overthrown their Babylonian captors. He's serving the king of his region as the cupbearer. And he gets to Jerusalem, excited to be reunited with this magical city he's heard about for years in exile, supposedly filled with Jewish people just like him. But what does he find? He finds a city that has been completely destroyed, a city that is no longer standing but is a pile of rubble. Sure, in an act of graciousness, the Persian Empire has given Jerusalem back to the Israelites. But there is literally nothing left but ash and a bunch of broken and burnt stones and rubble. And like anyone else, Nehemiah sees this and, and says to himself, well, life has just given me a big old bag of lemons, and I'm going to make some lemonade. So he thinks to himself, well, this isn't great, but you know what? I will rebuild this city and turn it into something that is wonderful, something that is great. And I'm sure my neighbors and the civilizations around us won't mind. What would it mean to them? Well, all of his neighbors minded, and all of them mocked him, and all of them plotted against him. They went so far as to lead their own armies towards Jerusalem, where Nehemiah and his laborers are tirelessly working on rebuilding the city. And they attack him. They attack him and his workers. They verbally and physically assault everyone there. So Nehemiah, feeling dejected and disillusioned, having been emotionally and physically beaten and attacked, says, well, you know what? That's all right. That's all right. I'm sure there are some of my fellow Israelites here still that were left behind after the Babylonian captivity. I'm sure they'll be sympathetic to this cause. But all he finds again is disappointment. What he discovers is that the few Israelites who are left near or outside or in Jerusalem, are either super wealthy and made all of their money by lending to poor Israelites who just needed to eat, charging exorbitant interest rates and taking advantage of them. And just so we're clear, the book of Leviticus, which Nehemiah would have been very familiar with, has a strict condemnation of charging interests on loans. I don't know if you guys knew that. That's an important note here. Because he goes to the council of the Israelites and he says, you are charging interest to your own people. It's bad enough that you're charging interest at all. You're charging interest to other Jews. And then the other Israelites who are there are so destitute and poor that they have had to sell their very own children into slavery just to survive. And as if the terrible interest rates their fellow Israelites were charging, as if the loans on their property weren't bad enough, as if other Jews taking their property from them was not enough, the very same king that Nehemiah works for and has a close working relationship with, who he's built a good reputation with, is charging the Israelites excessive taxes that they can only afford to pay by selling their children into slavery. What is incredible about the story of Nehemiah is not the architectural feat he embarks upon. 
But the fact that he starts this massive endeavor while also facing such harsh and unimaginable circumstances. And let me be clear for all of you, Nehemiah is not just rebuilding the wall. Nehemiah is rebuilding Jerusalem itself from the ground up. Yes, the wall is important, and the author focuses on the wall, because in Near Eastern ancient civilizations, cities were not cities unless they had walls. Walls were not only a defensive measure, they were the defining characteristic of a city. See, Nehemiah isn't just building a big wall. He is rebuilding the most sacred city in the world that has been decimated by the Babylonian Empire from the ground up, from nothing but ash and rubble. And he does so while he gets hit with one tragedy and misfortune after another. While I'm sure most of you have not had to literally rebuild an entire city from the ground up, and if you have, please come see Don and I after the service, because we have a opportunity for you here in the church. I'm sure that you have had an experience in your life or been in a place where you have had to accomplish a really big goal at work or you've set a really high expectation for yourself and are looking towards the future with aspiration and hope to achieve this big goal in your life. All the while, everything else in your life seems to be going wrong. I'm sure most of you have been in that space and at times have been openly chastised and made fun of for your aspirations and your desire to feel accomplished, just as Nehemiah was chastised and mocked for his feel to be for his need to feel accomplished. As a first generation college graduate, I can tell you all that I have felt that way most of my life. And I know for a fact that I am not alone in this room. Tomorrow we'll be celebrating our national holiday of Labor Day, where we come together and we take a day off of work to celebrate and remember those men and women who have dedicated their lives to the hard and difficult careers in this this country, who have literally paid their lives in order to make sure that our civilization was built from the ground up. I am the first man in my family in five generations to not be a carpenter. And I remember when I was young, people mocking my uncle and his friends who worked in other trades for their careers because they saw those jobs as dirty and beneath them. They mocked them for the goal of wanting to be carpenters one day. When my uncle was in high school and wanted to be a carpenter, he was mocked for not wanting to go to college. But we need those laborers, just like Nehemiah needed those laborers to build the city, just like Nehemiah was willing to give up on the goals and aspirations he had working for the king to build Jerusalem from the ground up, all while facing the difficulties of life. And what's really sad is that most people say, well, that's just life, suck it up, buttercup. And let me tell you what, there are few things I dislike more than hearing that. You know why? Because as followers of our God incarnate in Jesus Christ, the same God that spoke to Nehemiah, that isn't just life. Faith in the God of Abraham, Moses, Elijah, John the Baptist, John the Evangelist, Paul, Peter, and the Virgin Mary is not a faith that calls us to live with and be complacent with the pains and evils and sins of this life. It is not a faith that calls us to be complacent in the ridicule and the mocking. If we follow the example of Nehemiah, we see that faith in our God is a faith that allows us, in spite of the shame, physical abuse, ridicule, and suffering of this world, to live life to the fullest here and now and not just in the kingdom to come. That doesn't mean we're going to be rich. It doesn't mean that there won't be pain on the journey. But that our God calls us to be set apart by living into a life that gives us the resilience to face life's challenges with the hope and optimism of a living faith 
where we know, like Nehemiah knew when he was rebuilding Jerusalem from the ground up, God is not only an active force in our history. God is an active force here and now in this world, with us in this place, and always has been and always will be. The miracle of Nehemiah, as I said earlier, is not the architectural feat. If there was a book dedicated to just building a wall or building a city, which there isn't, what would be the point of reading Nehemiah? There wouldn't be one. I could just read any book, if that were the case, about any other architectural feat we've had in human history, whether it's the Empire State Building or La Sagrada Familia or, or the Pyramids of Giza, anything. I could read any book about the challenges the people who labored and toiled over those tasks, despite their difficulties, did. I could read any book. That's not what this book is about. No, the miracle of Nehemiah is that he accomplishes this major feat of rebuilding the most sacred city in the world while facing harsh realities that even in our own suffering, even in our own feeling of being proverbially kicked while we were down, most of us in this room could never comprehend. Most of us can never comprehend the idea of being so destitute that we've had to sell our children into slavery. Can you imagine trying to build a city from the ground up while seeing those around you selling their children into slavery, those you care about, those who are members of your family and God. Nehemiah stands as a testament of what we can do through the power of God, even when the world around us is broken and fractured by sin. Nehemiah, if, if you need a, 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 not a practical example, but an example that's more recent than Nehemiah some 2,400 years ago. Nehemiah's situation is much like the reality many black people in our history faced following the Emancipation Proclamation and the end of the Civil War. While the war was fought with the proper heart to free those in bondage and end the institution of chattel slavery in the United States that was abhorrent to God, when the war was over, and those who were once in bondage were newly freed. What did they inherit? Nothing. Much like Nehemiah, they inherited a pile of ash and rubble of what had been their lives. Never had people of color in the South been allowed to own property. Never had they been allowed to, to make a living wage. Never had they been allowed to study or learn or earn an education or even gain the basic needs necessary to secure employment, such as reading and writing. And they had nowhere to go. No shelter over their heads and no way of making any money. But certainly, even that state was better than being in bondage. But how were these former slaves supposed to start a life for themselves in this world with none of the tools they needed to rebuild their own proverbial Jerusalem? Similarly for Nehemiah, the Persian Empire was benevolent. And unlike the brutal Babylonians, they allowed the Jewish people to openly practice their faith and gave back to the Israelites their home in Jerusalem. But they didn't inherit any of the things they needed to thrive as a civilization. They didn't inherit any of the tools they needed to rebuild the city. Yet the miracle of these two groups... The former slaves of the post-war South and Nehemiah and his laborers in the book of Nehemiah is this, that through faith in God, they were able to rebuild despite and in spite of the constant degradation, dehumanization, criticism, and physical abuse, even to the point of death. In the wonderful documentary from PBS, the Black Church, This Is Our Story, This Is Our Song, narrated by Henry Louis Gates, which, if you have not seen, I recommend everyone go see it because it's an amazing testament of what God has done in our American history. Oprah Winfrey says this, talking about Christianity and the role of the church 
in American black life. The church gave black people a sense of worthiness. I do not know how we could have survived as a people without it. How often do we find ourselves in this world today where we feel so distanced from God, say we could not have survived as a people without it? What an amazing testament to the work of God in our history that the Christian church and the Christian God was able to allow the most oppressed people in our nation's history to persevere despite their difficulties. Is that not incredible that faith was able to do that? Faith in our God and Jesus Christ. And I use this example and reference this documentary and tell you this story not to make any political point. I don't have an agenda, but rather to observe one very important thing that I think we lose sight of in this modern church. It can be rather easy for us in the church today to read scripture, whether it's the Old or the New Testament, and to think, gosh, you know, God just does not work in our lives and in our history like he did when these books were written. But if the experience of the black church can tell us anything, it's that God is very much actively involved, not only in our history, but in our lives here and now, sustaining us through the most difficult times and giving us the tools to rebuild Jerusalem. Helping those who are fallen and being beaten down by society. Helping them pick themselves up time and time and time again. And thanks be to God. If you're still not convinced, and that example does not hit home with you, if you need evidence of it happening in this place right now, look around you. Really, look around you. Look around. There are people all around you. You are in a room of other people, most of whom have professed a belief in God and in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And we have all survived, despite the emotional, physical, and spiritual turmoil of the last year, the single deadliest disease of the last century. And we have done so as a community, not because of our own strength, but because of the strength of our faith in Jesus Christ and the power of our God. And it isn't just those of us in this room. There are hundreds of people who are going to watch this live stream right now, or who are watching this live stream, or will watch it when it is posted to YouTube, who are here and have come to this space through our digital means, not because they are living in fear, but because they know that even through the digital means of being in touch with this community, of being in touch with God and the Holy Scriptures, that they can have their fears and their anxieties relieved. They are here because they have faith and this place is giving them the courage they need to continue building those big projects of faith in their lives. Y'all, Nehemiah is not a book about a wall. It's a book about a people who are disinherited and being kicked while they're down. And a leader who is brave and faithful enough to do the hard work that needs to be done, despite the difficulties, despite the ridicule, and despite the abuse. The book of Nehemiah is about us. It's about us, a people who have faith in God, doing what God calls us to do, even when others think it is ridiculous and shouldn't be done. Even when things in life are not just hard, but actively bad, Nehemiah is a reminder that our God is active in our lives and that we don't believe in some transcendent pie-in-the-sky God, some mythical watchmaker who made the universe and walked away, but instead a God who is working through, in, and around us to give us the same strength Nehemiah had to do the impossible even when we don't have the resources even when it makes others mock us, and even when things are just downright terrible. God is in this place, today, in this time, 
And he is guiding each and every hand, heart, and head in this church to be like Nehemiah and to continue rebuilding this place, not for what we had in the past, but for the sake of the future that God has promised us for tomorrow here at Fountain City United Methodist Church and in the United Methodist Church and in the Church Universal. We've all been kicked while we were down in this past year. But the good news is that because God is in this place, He has given us the tools to rebuild and start anew. So hear the good news. We're getting kicked while we're down. But our God is here with us in this place, calling us to do the impossible and rebuild Jerusalem. In the name of the Creator, Sustainer, and Redeemer, Amen. As we join now in a time of celebrating Holy Communion, I want just to remind you as a congregation of people who are gathered in this space, uh, those who gather with us online, that we celebrate what's called an open table, meaning that everyone is invited to participate. It doesn't matter if you're a member of this church or any church. What matters is your heart is pointed toward Christ and you are welcome to receive. And in a few moments, there'll be an opportunity to come forward. You'll receive a piece of bread and be given to you as a body of Christ. You'll be offered a cup. You can dip it in that cup. And this is the offering you as a, the blood of Christ to remember, to take and to eat. You'll come by the center aisle, and you'll be able to either kneel or receive by standing. But I want you to know that this is an open table, and all are welcomed here. I invite you to turn to page 12, 18. Thank you, Chase. Turn to page 18 in your hymnal. And we'll have a sung response. Chase and I will lead in the, the light print. And you all, with the help of the choir and Leslie, will be singing a response on page 18. Actually, it is page 12. I messed up. We'll page start 12. on page 12, yeah. and then when we're done with the confession and pardon, we'll move to page 18. I apologize. I led Don astray. That's what I like about Chase. He doesn't mind I ask for forgiveness, and you know, you know, that's good, Chase. I like that. You're Thanks. modeling. That's very good. I stumble a lot and lead yeah, yeah. Don in the wrong direction often. So, I mean, you're dressed like me today, so I was just kind of like, you know, just yeah. give you a little grace. There. We're twins. That's right. So Christ our Lord invites to His table all who love Him, who earnestly repent of their sin, and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful, Merciful God, God, we confess, we confess that, that we, we have not loved you with our whole heart. heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. To God. Amen. Amen. Now continuing on page 18. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave it to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is On us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine that they may be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood by your spirit make us one with Christ one with each other and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes again and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. confidence of the children of God, let us pray that prayer Jesus taught us to so faithfully pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We invite those who are helping serve communion to come forward at this time. And as they make their way forward, I just remind you of the, of the way that we'll be receiving today. And there'll be four stations. There'll be two that'll be standing here in front of the altar rail, and then there'll be two that'll be behind the altar rail. For those who wish to uh, receive by standing, um, you can do that here in front of the altar rail. And those who will be coming back, you can, if you receive standing, you can kneel. Or those want to come forward and kneel first to receive, that's fine. Uh, but again, we'll be giving you a piece of bread, and you'll take that and dip it in the juice and then to receive. If you're unable to come forward or feel uncomfortable coming forward, uh, know that we can bring these elements to you. And if you'd rather have one of those self-contained cups that has a wafer on top, we have those available to you. Just let an usher know that you'd like to receive one, and those are available, and they can bring it to you from the lobby in the narthex. So I'm going to invite our, our servers, if you'll come forward as we give you the elements.
like to receive the elements that are gluten-free, um, it is on this side, and you just come my direction, and I'll make sure you receive those. The table is set. The ushers will guide us.
Jesus, number 189. quick announcements before we disperse. I just want to give a quick shout out to some people who are at home right now who are struggling with illness who I'd like to lift up in prayer. One of those is Mark Thomas who is recovering from surgery that was successful this week. Another is Louise Spar who is currently in hospice care and also for our beloved member Van Stewart. We ask that you keep all of them in prayers and join us in remembering them while they are watching from home. And also, Wednesday night, we will continue to have Wednesday night fellowship. Please come out if you are able. It is really an exciting opportunity, and uh, I think you'll really enjoy this week's speaker. It's pretty special. Also, we will be having a uh, From Chase's Kitchen cooking class, which there's a horrible photo of me on the internet if you'd like to find it. Did not know that Tennessee Orange adds 40 pounds on the camera. Um, <laughs> It is aimed towards people who are over 60, but if you are not over 60 and would like to attend, uh, just let me or Melissa, Melissa Green know. I know a guy. We can probably pinch you in. Uh, he's kind of annoying, but I'll get it done for you. You don't have to do it yourself. So, uh, No, really, uh, join us for that. I think that's an exciting opportunity. Now, as we go from this place, know that God is with us, and God has given each and every one of you the tools to rebuild Jerusalem. So go in a spirit of renewal, and reconstruction 
hoping to build a new society, a new church, and a new love for Christ in the world. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.